uh, please be seated and thank you Serenity for leading us and that beautiful end up being a carol, didn't it? It's a carol, so nice to stay that Christmas carol. So uh, next um, Sunday uh, we'll be sharing the communion and we'll be continuing on the series of Ezekiel as we start tonight. But we'll just be just giving you a little glimpse about what we're going to be doing over Christmas because this year our Saturday service starts on in fact, it's Christmas Eve, so our Christmas Eve service the 24th will be our Saturday service. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about that next week. We'll get some flyers out so we can invite our friends, family, neighbours. We want it to be a, an event where we want and we'll be asking them to take some and take part of the service as well. So it's just going to be a special time. Um, I just want to read, um, oh, Sharon and I went to our Southern Cross um, meeting at Paul and Sasha, no, Paul and Sasha, Spoke there before, our state directors and our national directors, John and Elaine, were both there. And so they've just put out a, a newer booklet for Southern Cross members. I've only got two copies, but I'd love you to take one because it's been reprinted and it just gives um, the, um, I guess, statement of faith, the values, and some really just good biblical stuff of what Southern Cross wants to impart through their church. So if you want to take one, just read it and bring it back because I've, I've found them. Um, it really good that John has put a lot of work into that to put it together. So I'll leave them out there for that. Um, I want to open just with um, because tonight's like um, I guess it's going to be an overview of the Book of Ezekiel because there's um, 48 chapters. So we obviously over three it's a lot to cover. So it's really just going to be an overview <coughs> tonight. I'll be using that board in a minute to help explain it. But um, I'm going to just read three verses, the first three verses of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 1, and then we're going to pray. Okay, so this is Ezekiel, because he wrote it. He said, in my 30th year, this is Ezekiel 1, number 3, in my 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kiba River, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiachin, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzzai, by the Kiba River in the land of the Babylonians. There the hand of the Lord was on him. Now in those three verses it says, it basically tells us about the whole book of Ezekiel. Firstly, that the heavens were opened and he saw a vision. Pretty powerful, isn't it? Secondly, it represents a time in history which we can look at in a minute. And third, it says, there the hand of the Lord was on him. And so we're going to look at what the hand of the Lord did through Ezekiel's life. And we're going to pray first, so let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, as we open up your book tonight, uh, and particularly in the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel, Lord, we can learn so much from some of these characters, Lord. What, how much they gave up for you, Lord. And really, the position they were placed in, in a, in a position of authority, your authority, Lord, to... to Preach and to prophesy. And so, Lord, as we open up your word, Lord, we ask that you open up our hearts because there's a message for each of us here tonight. Maybe a different message, but, Lord, there is a message in this Old Testament book of Ezekiel. So, Lord, we pray that you open up our hearts, open up our ears to hear what you, what you want us to hear tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I want you to think Jerusalem, 623 B.C., so, a long time ago, but in that year, Buzzai and his wife, I don't know, she probably had a funny name too, they all had funny names back there, but they had a baby and they called him Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel means God strengthens. Remember that? God strengthens Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel grew up in an incredible part of Israel's history because he was born in 623, there was a godly king on the throne. Now, don't forget, Ezekiel, is talk, we're talking about the kingdom of Judah, like the southern kingdom, but it was ten tribes, the northern kingdom. They'd already disappeared off the, off the, the planet, basically, because they, Assyria overtook them in 722 BC. We're talking about the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. This is where Ezekiel was prophesying. And so, he's living the life. He's the son of a priest, which means he's going to have a lifetime dedicated to being a priest. Now don't forget, this is God's order because one of the tribes, the tribe of Levi, was set aside for priestly duties. And so he comes through a very godly line, the family of Zadok, which goes right back, this, um, if you go right, trace it right back to Aaron. So from a very godly family. But his whole life is built around 
becoming a priest. The great thing is they weren't Catholics, they could marry, so the priest married, because how else do you produce a little priest? Just to have a wife. So that's how it happened, because not, the Catholics can't do that. They can't produce a little well, if they did. Yeah, yeah, we won't go there, but anyway, so he, he is in this position of going to school, but knowing that he, from the age of 20 to the age of 30, He's doing uh, a degree, a master's, a degree, probably a doctorate in theology, because for 10 years he's studying. And what happens at the age of 30? He becomes a priest. And so, we think about Jesus, don't we? At the age of 30, he started his ministry as well. So, born into the, the family of Zadok, and he's schooling in a priestly school where he's learning all about how to be a priest. And so, the king of Judah, Josiah, he came as a young boy to the throne because his father was killed. And what does he do? He finds the old scrolls, the, the book, the, the scrolls, the history of the Jewish nation and what they're meant to be doing and realise that none of this was happening in the temple. He restored temple life, he restored churches, he restored uh, basically what you call today is Christian living, having churches open and dedicated to serving God. He got rid of all the stuff that shouldn't have been there, the idols, the, the, the idolatry, all that was removed during Josiah's reign. And so while this boy, Ezekiel, was watching all this happening, as a teenager, probably at the age of 15 and 16, his king is killed in battle. So Pharaoh Necho, which was the pharaoh at the time, there's all these different pharaohs, N-E-C-O, that was his name, Necho, Pharaoh Necho, it rhymes. So he comes along, has a battle with Josiah, so it was probably a good way to sort things out. I wish some countries would do that. They all get together and the kings fight, but unfortunately Josiah lost, and so he was killed. And so we have the situation of a godly king no longer. The son comes on the throne, and what happens? The son decides to go back to the old way of life, which is really, really sad. And I think his dad was a godly king, and everything was looking so good. So we're looking at a history of Babylon, who's trying to take over Judah, and you've also got Egypt. So Egypt, Babylon, both demanding money, both demanding to, to um, virtually to to. Every, to they're in subjection to two countries. If they don't pay the money, they're wiped out. So, it was virtually in the end Babylon that came along and basically took Jerusalem after a long siege, 605 BC, and the first lot of exiles are taken to Babylon. So remember Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they're the first ones that go off to exile. So, I'm going to grab this board, I'm going to get Sharon to grab the two chairs for me while I grab this board. We need to have a little bit of a history lesson. For a minute, just look at this. So I'm going to get you to grab those chairs. I'm going to plonk it right there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well done. Okay, so I'll get on this side. I bet you haven't got a red point. No, I haven't. I've got a ball one for you. I'll tell you what, if you see a little red point on my head, just turn it to duck. <laughs> Can you see that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. So so, what I've got there is dates. Now, 597 is a very important date because that was when they were deported. They were virtually the country was taken over by Babylon. And those other dates there, you've got 589 BC, which is the siege of Jerusalem, and then 586 is the fall of Jerusalem, which was prophesied by Ezekiel. You've also got all the kings. Remember, I talked about Josiah, godly king, his son Jehoiakim, and then Jehoiakim, Kim. So, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim. The first deportation takes place, then you've got Jehoiakim, and this was he was named by Nebuchadnezzar, all right? All sons, and then Zedekiah. Then we've got the siege of Jerusalem, the fall of Jerusalem, and then Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes over, okay? So they've got on that one. Far side, we've got some dates for Ezekiel. As I said, born 623 BC, he was taken to Babylon in 597 BC, and he's called to be a prophet in 592 BC. And he starts prophesying 592 to 589. The first time he's bereaved while his wife dies. And the second prophecy takes place 586 to 585 BC. Prophesies for the third time in 567 BC. Now I'll leave that up there because for the rest of the night I'll be referring to some of that. So um, it's it's on the board. It just gives us a history lesson. This actually took place. It's in history. You can look it up and you can see it's all there. It's just going to help us as we look at this man's life 
recognising that he was taken away, deported, around 26, 27 years of age, which meant he could not become a priest because the priest had to operate from the, from the temple in Jerusalem. There was no authority to, to operate outside of that. So when they went to Babylon, yes, they finally set up synagogues, but they couldn't operate as priests. It could only be done through Jerusalem. So he lost his role as a priest when he was deported. And he never, ever was able to um, take the, the authority of being a priest. Instead, he became a prophet. Okay, so he'd also grown up all these stories about the kingdom, northern kingdoms above him. And like I said, in 722 BC, quite a bit before, the people had been overthrown by the Assyrians. So Assyrian was a cruel race, but like the Babylonian. They left, no, they left no traces, they killed everybody, and they took a few people with them, just the important people that could make, that could help them, and took them like the Babylonians did, the important people, they took them, and they left actually just a small remnant just to do the farming so they could still get value out of these people. So it was a terrible thing that had happened to, the, to Israel, the northern kingdom, and it was going to happen to the southern kingdom. He also witnessed some really great preaching, because he had the writings of Isaiah, which was a prophet before him. So Isaiah prophesied through four kings and right up to just before Josiah. So he prophesied for many years. So he would have had the writings of Isaiah. He would have um, heard Micah. He would have heard Jeremiah. They were contemporaries. But all that teaching basically fell on deaf ears for the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The, the prophets spoke God's word. And you know what the people said? We don't want to listen to that. And often what the kings did, they, had, they appointed their own prophets. You know, I've often seen that, you know, when you get a situation, in, uh, whether it's a parliament or a, 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 in a public service situation, they realise, I need to appoint people that are going to speak what I want to think. And, what I, and so they have their own little people of power that will only do what they tell them what to do. And that's exactly what was happening in the time of the kings, that these prophets were appointed by the king to prophesy what he wanted to hear. They got paid well to do it. It was all lies. Ezekiel was one of the few that spoke the truth because he spoke God's word. So he had great preaching through Isaiah. He, he'd um, listened to obviously Micah, Jeremiah. We, but we also need to look at the attitude of the people of that time. So unfortunately, the message of the prophets for both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, it fell on deaf ears. They went back to following foreign gods. They intermarried with foreign countries. They were told from the very beginning when they went into, go, when they went into the chosen land, the promised land, not to intermarry with, with the tribes around them. But they chose to do the opposite. They intermarried. They took the foreign gods, the idols, and they just rebelled against God. So God sent the prophets. He sent Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, Amos, Joel, there were so many prophets that he sent. And nearly every time the people failed to listen. In fact, if you read Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel 2, 5, Ezekiel 9, 9, Ezekiel 6, 8, God calls them a rebellious and stubborn people. A rebellious and stubborn people. Because they refuse to listen to the prophets. You know, if you think about it, if you go through all the prophets, there's really only one prophet that the people listened to. Do you know who that was? One prophet where the people listened to and repented. Jesus. Jonah. Jonah. And who was he going to? He was going to the Assyrians. The people that weren't even, they weren't even part of Israel. They were the enemies. And that's one of the things about Jonah. And he got really angry with God because he preached and they repented. And he, he almost didn't want them to because he, he actually hated them. He hated the Assyrians. You know, that were the opposition, they were the ones that came in and killed all the Israelites. So it seems to me that the only time where you see a prophet preach is when he preached to the opposition, to the baddies, and they repented. But actually it was only temporarily, it was just for one generation. And it's a bit like this, um, the Northern South Kingdom. There was one generation of a good king and then it always went back to the old ways, idolatry, intermarrying amongst the other nations. And dropping all the temple life. So in other words, the prophets and the priests had no power. No one listened to them. That's funny because I don't see the world today how they don't listen, they don't listen to the church anymore. 
you know, 50 years ago, people wanted some wisdom, or they, you know, the newspaper wanted to know how should we handle this situation. They went to the, they went to the priests, they went to the ministers for advice. Unfortunately, they don't even do they? They go to the experts. <laughs> so the people struggling with their own inner self, struggling because they are stubborn and obstinate people. Another interesting thing about Ezekiel tonight as we look through the story of Ezekiel is that when God speaks to Ezekiel, he calls him by a name. He calls him the son of man. Now that is, that's amazing when you think about it. 83 times, I think it's recorded, that he's called son of man. And now the only other time that is used in all the Bible is in his reference to Jesus. So, you know, God saw him very highly and he used his name son of man. Like I said Jesus used that title and people refer to Jesus as son of man. So it's interesting when you think about it, that God held him in a high regard and often we just stick to them and think, what, you know, what the this all about? But God referred to him as son of man because he had a huge message to share to the people, not only to the people of that time, but the, as you'll see in the last prophecy, to, to talk about the future, what's going to happen in the future that still hasn't happened. Another interesting, oh yeah, the other thing was he was a contemporary, I think I told you that Jeremiah said at the same time as the prophet Jeremiah, Habakkuk, and also Daniel. So he would have either met them or would have been a contemporary of, yes. Daniel is not correct. Well, that's right, we'll talk about that later. That's what I'm just saying. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, okay, we'll talk about it later. Yeah. Yeah. It's all right. No, no, we'll talk about it later. Rex? We'll talk about it later, okay? No, we'll talk about it later, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, yeah. All right, so, now, he was deported in his 26th year. Remember we talked about that? In his 26th year, so he was unable to carry out the duties of a priest. In fact, by the end of Nebuchadnezzar's siege, there was nothing left of Jerusalem. There was no temple, and it was prophesied by Ezekiel and other prophets that nothing would be left, because he took everything, and he took the key people from Jerusalem, and took them to Babylon, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and all those other people, and he took them to use them in positions of authority because they had the, he knew they had the brains and he knew they could do the right thing in that country. And what he left back in his own country, back in Jerusalem, was just a very small remnant of people, basically farmers, people that had very little skills, and so he just left them knowing that nothing would happen, and nothing did happen, unfortunately. So there we have it, deported in his 26th year. So instead of becoming a priest at the age 30, he becomes a prophet. That's funny because someone else started their ministry at 30, didn't they? Jesus, he started his ministry at 30 as well. So he starts his ministry about 30, and then roughly five years later after his deportation, while he's sitting on the banks of the Kiba River, so K-E-B, so it's Kiba, it's actually it's spelled C-H-E-B-A-R, but we pronounce it Kiba. So the Kiba River, interesting enough, even today, one of those tributaries still exists. So you've got the Euphrates and the, what's the two big rivers? The Tigris and the Euphrates. And I think it's the, they both, Euphrates goes through Babylon. And so what the king did at that time was to get these two rivers and put channels and irrigation channels. So like when you go across the Hague Plains and you see some of those massive fields, and there's the water coming just for miles and miles doing all those cornfields and places like that. So they had all these channels, all these irrigation channels, so people could live and grow in the whole area. And so they were on the southern part of Babylon, and so they were on the Kiba River, which was a tributary of the Euphrates. So there they are, and Psalm 137 1 tells us about it, doesn't it? Because it says, by the rivers of Babylon. And there's a song by Boney Yeah, I can sing it. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> we sat down. Oh, that's enough. <laughs> so that, that's it. So that's, okay. that's the song. So yes, we sing it, but that's exactly where it comes from. It's the story of the exiles who were stuck in the rivers of Babylon. And they were so upset because they couldn't practice what they learned in Jerusalem. They couldn't go to church. They couldn't do any of the things. And they were there, desperate to get back. But the prophecy said that it wasn't going to be for another 70 years, because Daniel tells us it's 70 years before they could come back. So therefore, all these people that were deported lived and died in Babylon, including Daniel and including Ezekiel. Yeah. So there they have it, on the rivers of Babylon, 
And the, it tells us that in that fifth year, Ezekiel has a vision. And it's a vision, firstly, about what's going to happen. And we're going to talk about that next week, that first vision, because he has a vision of heaven. And the amazing thing is, it's almost word for word and picture for picture of what John saw in Revelation. And it's incredible when you actually compare the similarities. And we're going to talk a bit about that next week. I'm not going to cover it now because it's quite fascinating as different people in the Bible have been able to look and see heaven because God, as it says here, the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. So we know that he saw it. Yeah, so there he is. So after this, has his first vision, he preached and roughly for three years he preached and he did miracles. But he was also required, as you, if you read, and I challenge you to read Ezekiel, it's a hard read, and I hope you've read 2 Kings 22 to 25, because that's the backdrop of the kings here in the story, and it helps to fill it in. And we're going to also talk about the week after, about the prophecy about one of the kings as well that came exactly true, as he'd made a hole in the wall to escape, and there was a prophecy that there was going to be a hole in the wall where they would escape, but they were all caught, so, and that was all prophesied as well by Ezekiel. So, three years prophesying for the first time, and then there's a long gap, as often there is for prophets. We don't know what he did for that period, but there was a long gap. And then the second um, time he prophesied, a terrible thing happens to Ezekiel, because God tells Ezekiel that his wife is going to die. And you can read it in Ezekiel. And he says, well, and when your wife dies, that's going to be the exact time when Jerusalem falls to Babylon. And when he checked it out, that's exactly what happened. Ezekiel lost his wife, and Israel lost their way, and lost their king, because Babylon took over. So when you look at Ezekiel, he prophesied three times, but there firstly for three years, then for one year, and then finally just for a few months. He was aged around 50 when he prophesied for the last time, and then we know that he died, he passed away in his probably just in his early 50s. Now, you know, he's buried near Baghdad. Baghdad, if you go to South Baghdad, there's still at Ezekiel's tomb, which many people just, and the historians say that that is the tomb of Ezekiel. It is still there to this day. If you go to South Babylon, you'll find the tomb of Ezekiel still there to this day. So it's pretty amazing when you think about it. And he's still revered by the, the, by the Muslims and by the Christians, it's quite, and by the people of Babylon, because they know his history. Sometimes they know the history better than we do. But it's interesting to think that so long ago, there's still a tomb, the tomb of Ezekiel. Okay, now we've got 48 chapters. We're not, obviously not going to get through them all in these next few weeks, but I'd love you to read it, because it is, it's just heavy reading, a lot of it. So in those 48 chapters, like most prophecies, you've got the first bit, the first 32 chapters are on judgment, and this is about God's judgment on Israel. And then from chapters 33 to 48, it's what they call the consolation. So the period where God recognises or, or tells them that the people that have been judging them and, and putting them down are going to be accounted for. There's, there's, there's the woes against them and they prophesy what's going to happen to them and that's what happened to them all. Most of those nations were wiped out because of their idolatry and the way they treated Israel. They've got those prophecies. And then also, the last prophecy is about the future times, about what we read about in Revelation. And that's all there, right through. So you've got the judgment and then the consolation. So over these next three or four weeks, we're going to be looking at those three prophecies of Ezekiel. It's going to be challenging, but I think it's important that we look at this Old Testament book to see that it's there for a reason. It's there because we look at the people and we look at the prophecies and then we look at the nations around Israel that God actually used those nations, those evil, evil nations, to bring judgment on Israel because of the lifestyle they were living. You know, if it wasn't for the lifestyle they were living, none of this would have happened. But God had said right at the very beginning, when the first king came on the throne, when David came on the throne, and he said even when they went in Deuteronomy, when you read, they went into the chosen land, God set some standards and he set some principles and he set some laws in place. All he asked them to obey those laws, they fail. You know, God's done the same thing with our nations today. There's some laws and principles that actually work. They're there for a reason. And when people don't follow those principles and laws, society breaks down. 
And that's exactly what is happening today. If we could only follow God's word and see how much a difference it would make in families, in schools, in society, in all levels of life. But what I want to do tonight, as, as we look at Ezekiel, there's one thing that stands out for me, that really stands out for me, and I think in a lot of, uh, of, uh, of, I guess, the books that I've read, one thing that really stands out. And it's one of the main lessons, I think, out of Ezekiel, and it's, it's the sin of apathy and pride. The sin of apathy and pride. As God said, the obstinate and stubborn people. So I want to read Ezekiel 28, 11 to 19. And you may have heard this before because it's a prophecy against the king of Tyre, but it's also a prophecy against Lucifer or Satan. Okay, so the... Uh, so I've got, um, what did I say, um, Ezekiel 28, I'm going to read just from 11 to 19. So this is Ezekiel talking, he said, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, is that word again, Son of man, take up all men concerning the king of Tyre, and say to him, This is what the sovereign Lord says, You were the soul, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, carnelian, chrysolite, and emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub. For so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created, till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you to disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth, I made a spectacle of you before kings. But your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out of you, and it consumed you, and I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you, and have come to a horrible end, and you will be no more. So there it is. That's, that's a prophecy against the king of Tyre, but also against Lucifer. And so it's actually, as I said, the description of the fall of Satan. And verse 17 says, Your heart became proud on account of your beauty. Your heart became proud. And you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. The Apostle Paul, he warns about becoming conceited and falling under that same judgment as the devil in 1 Timothy 3, 6. And then John reminds us that the pride of life, remember the pride of life, it comes not from the Father, but from the world. So this pride of life, this um, stubbornness, this apathy, this pride, it doesn't come from the Father. It doesn't come from the Father, but it comes from the world. It comes from Satan. So the people in Ezekiel's time, they love the world more than God. They love the treasures more than God. They love their lifestyle more than God. And they ended up losing it all because of that. There's a quote um, I just want to propose with that... Um, because David Jeremiah calls it sinful pride. But just listen to what he says. This, this is David Jeremiah just quoting from about sinful pride about this, this chapter. He says, Sinful pride is taking our eyes off God and all that he has done for us and preoccupying ourselves instead with our appearance, with our possessions, with our attributes, and with our accomplishments. It is so easy to do, and it can happen in a flash. Even in the midst of worship, even in the midst of a sermon. You know, sometimes we're sitting through a sermon and thinking about it, oh, not, and oh, it happens so quickly, doesn't it? We let down our guard for a moment and pride slips in like a burglar through an unlatched window. We let down our guard for a moment and pride slips in like a burglar through an unlatched window. Peter warns us that God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. 1 Peter 5 5. And he goes on to say, if we long for God's grace and favour, we must remain vigilant against a sin older than earth itself. So 
But that was Ezekiel's prophecy against being apathetic and having pride or being proud over things that we've done. But we've got to remember, it's not what we've done, it's what, it's what God's done in our life. So, that, so I'm going to just finish off there because basically I wanted to just have an overview, some history lessons, and next week we're going to delve into that first um, prophecy when, when God takes us here, into heaven, and there's some really weird things in there, but they can all be explained. And I'd love you to start reading that first prophecy and see what you think as well. So basically the people of the time had lost interest in God. The people of that time had chosen their own ways, their own lifestyles. The people today, as we live, have done exactly the same thing. They've chosen their own lifestyle. They've become proud. They've become arrogant. And they don't need God anymore. They don't need God in their life. We know that we do need God in our life today. We so need God in this world today. He is the answer for all these problems that people are going through. Ezekiel tried to prophesy that. And some of the other prophets did. And I just think of how much this man gave up. Like I said, can you imagine starting a career but not starting it? A whole lifetime training, you know, you've done nearly 10 years of training, and you know, we're never going to use that training. But God had other ideas, and often He has other ideas for us. We've set ourselves up to become whatever, and all of a sudden it all crashes. Well, it actually hasn't crashed, it's just a refix that God puts in our life. To retune us, to refine us, and to put us in the direction where He wants us to be. He knows our weaknesses, He knows our strengths, He knows our abilities, and sometimes He has to stop us in our tracks. Because He even had His whole life planned for Him. He didn't realise that God was going to meet Him on a river, on a bank of a river in a place He'd never lived before, where exiles were living, out of His homeland in another country. And yet God spoke to Him, He opened up the heavens, and He can open up the heavens to us tonight. And speak to us through his word. And so I pray that you can think about the story of Ezekiel, think about the character of Ezekiel, recognise that whatever I'm going through, there's always someone that's gone through something worse, like Ezekiel. He probably never saw his family again when you think about it. He went because he was taken, he didn't choose that lifestyle, and yet God used him to speak to the people. And we're also going to look at some other things in the next few weeks, but tonight, history lesson. Think about the character, think about the, the, the book, but also think about just that one chapter, chapter 28, the prophecy against the king of Tyre, particularly the sin of pride and arrogance. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, just thank you that we've started this journey on the book of Ezekiel. Lord, we thank you for um, a man that was um, destined for greatness as, as he thought, and yet you took him out of his homeland and sent him to a foreign land. And in that foreign land, you spoke to him, Lord. You revealed the heavens to him. Lord, it doesn't matter where we are tonight in our life, you can speak to us, Lord. And so, Lord, tonight we just want to um, admit if we've, been, if we've strayed away from the truth, Lord, if we've strayed away as the children of Israel did, Lord, help us to come back to you, Lord. Lord, you're always there with open arms to take us back in, Lord. And help us, Lord, when things happen in our life to recognise that it's you, Lord, that have done it for us. But help us not to have that arrogance and pride that the King of Tyre had and made himself so proud of him and so boastful, Lord, that it brought about his downfall. But we want to give all the glory to you tonight and pray that you'll continue to use us to walk in your ways, Lord, and, Lord, to listen, to hear your voice speak to us, Lord, through your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.